Okay, so I'm going to ask you to please hear, open your ears spiritually, what the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you today as it's spoken to me as I have studied and prepared. Now, uh, we're going to start in Daniel chapter 5 and begin with verses 1 through 7. Uh, It said, many years later, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for 1,000 of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and concubines, drank from them. Now while they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Not a good idea. Number uh, Verse 5, suddenly they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. And the king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear. That's pretty freaky. That's the same thing what happened to me. Uh, His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. The king shouted for his enchanters, astrologers, fortune tellers to be brought before him. And he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever can read this writing and tell me what it means will be dressed in purple robes of royal honor and will have a gold chain placed around his neck and he will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Okay, so what we have, we have King Belshazzar, okay, who is the son of King Nebuchadnezzar. You need to keep that in mind. That's important. And he decided it was going to be a good idea to bring what was set aside as uh, sanctified or set apart as holy for God, okay, and make it common. Uh, now, you know, there, there's a danger in doing that, church. And, and I'll be honest with you, uh, sometimes I have fear and trepidation in my life. If you've ever watched any of the late night talk shows, they're always profaning and mocking holiness. Okay, anything that's of Christian virtue, anything that has value, uh, you know, any, anything that is holy, the world mocks it. And let me tell you what, uh, when you begin to mock the things of God that God has set apart as holy or as holy unto Him, you're now on dangerous uh, territory. I, I, I pray for some of these late night talk show hosts, okay? They, so Belshazzar profanes what's holy, and by doing that, he's actually profaning the Holy One. And out of nowhere, this hand appears. I mean, uh, I mean, just put yourself right there. I mean, you're in the midst of a party. I mean, you think you're having a good time, then this hand appears just out of nowhere. It didn't say an arm. It just said a hand. I don't know if it's like Cousin It or out of the Adams family or, or, or what it looked like, but I mean, this hand appears and begins to write on the wall. And, and so fear consumed him. He changed colors. He basically buckled and fell to the floor, and he calls for his enchanters and wise men, please interpret the message, and they're unable to do it. So what we didn't read, what happened next was basically this. Uh, the queen, she said, hey, 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 remember Daniel. Well, here, here we go again. Remember Daniel. All right, he, he's the guy that's got some wisdom. Uh, your, your, your father brought him in, Nebuchadnezzar, and used him. Let's find him and bring him to the party here. So let's go to verses 13 through 16. So, so Daniel was brought before the king. And the king asked him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles brought from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar? I have heard that you have the spirit of the gods within you and that you are filled with insight, understanding, and wisdom. My wise men and enchanters have tried to read the words on the wall and tell me their meaning, but they cannot do it. I am told that you can give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read these words and tell me their meaning, you will be clothed in purple robes of royal honor, and you will have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. So to make a long story short, short, basically Daniel replies to the king this, I don't want your stuff. Okay, keep it. I don't want it. I don't need it. So today's message is the handwriting on the wall or the handwriting. Okay, and we're going to look at, at the very first word today. We're going to focus on the first word that was interpreted 
uh, by uh, Daniel this morning. Okay, we're going to look at the second word next week and the third, the last. That's how important I believe this message. Remember, it is a prophetic word from the hand of God. God wrote the message. Therefore, that word is eternal. So it's for us today, 2018, okay? So, so we're going we're gonna to begin this morning. You know, Belshazzar was literally overtaken by the culture's greatest delusion. This man was deceived and he was distracted because deception and distraction kept him from seeing the value of his life, just like it does us. Many people are deceived today because they think they have forever. And many people are distracted by so many things that they don't fulfill their God-given purpose on this earth. Belshazzar was both deceived and distracted. And this deception and distraction kept him from learning this value of his life. And it kept him from learning three important lessons. The first lesson he failed to learn was, that's your first fill-in, Belshazzar failed to learn from his father's sin. Nebuchadnezzar disregarded the warning of Daniel that Daniel interpreted in his dream. Nebuchadnezzar's pride led him to to believe that he was powerful, that he built Babylon, and that it was about his glory and not God's. He disregarded that God in heaven rules. He thought he ruled, so he exalted himself above God. Belshazzar saw firsthand, this is his son, he saw firsthand his father's sin, and he saw the consequence to that pride that was in his life. And he was deceived like many of us are. Okay, that happened to Dad, but it won't happen to me. Why? Because I am the exception to the rule. That's deception. When we think we're the exception to the rules, we're now walking in the, in the darkness of deception. I won't get caught. This won't harm me. Okay? Yeah, I've heard, you know, I, we can take it to as base as this. Hey, you know, drinking and driving is wrong, I know. You know, and, and, and these people get killed by drunk drivers. But you know what? I can handle it. I can do it. I can drive anyway. I'm the exception to the rule. Right? That's the way people live. That's the way people think. That's exactly what Belshazzar, I'm the exception. I see. He saw his father's sin. He was also distracted by his own self-interest. Okay? See, when we fail to learn from past failures, whether it's as a nation or a church or in our own individual lives, how many of you, let me just, let's just be honest, I'm raising my hand first, that you've made the same mistake more than once, knowing you were going to mess up again? I have... And probably you that didn't raise your hand, you're just lying right there. You're just lying in church. Because you probably shot your mouth off one time, said, i got to quit doing that, then shot it off again. Okay? All right? Galatians 6, 7 says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. He's saying right there, don't deceive yourself. All right? You're not, you're not the exception to the rule. Belshazzar's pride led him to mock the things of God, and he was deceived into thinking that he was exempt from the consequence. Second thing that Belshazzar failed to learn was his, from his father, the father's change. He failed to see his father change from a life of pride to a life of humility. He failed to see his own father's redemption and turnaround. He failed to see his, the the the. the redemptive power of God when his father looked to heaven and said that heaven rules and in a moment he went from being insane to being totally sane. Belshazzar failed to see that and witness that. He failed to see because his father began to walk in humility that God then restored his entire kingdom, not just his sanity. 
He failed to see these things. He failed to learn the lessons. The third thing that he failed was to heed his father's warning. <coughs> Daniel 4.37, this is what Nebuchadnezzar said to his son. He said it to the nation. He said, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All of his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. He's saying, man, my pride reduced me to insanity. You need to know, nation, you need to know, son, it's about humility. It's not about pride. And he said, he'll humble you. He failed to see that. See, when we ignore past sins, when we ignore what true redemption looks like, and we fail to desire that, and we ignore all of God's warnings, there's going to be a consequence. Okay? It's going to be one, church. Daniel then begins to tell the king, King, you don't want to hear what these words mean. That you, like your dad, you're full of pride, you're full of arrogance, you've exalted yourself above God, you didn't learn any lessons, and you've mocked God. He was saying to Belshazzar, man, you're living a life of deception. You think you don't, you're not going to suffer a consequence. He said, the writing's on the wall. The writing's on the wall. Let's take a look at five, uh, chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. He says this, For you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have had these cups from his temple brought before you. You and your nobles and your wives and concubines have been drinking wine from them and praising the gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all, but you have not honored the one who gives you the breath of life. And he controls your destiny. So God has sent this hand to write this message. This is where we get the handwriting's on the wall. It's still used today. And when people say that, something's about to drop. It's always an expression of imminent doom. Now remember, Daniel is a prophetic book. It's speaking to us. And the handwriting is on the wall for us as a warning today. It stands today. So let's look at what was said, Daniel 5 and 25. This is the message that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parison. What can we learn from these warnings today? Daniel begins with the first one, Mene. So let's go to verse 26. Mene means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Now, how does that apply to you and me today in 2018? Number one, first of all, and the feeling is this, our days are numbered. We need to understand that. Your days are numbered. My days are numbered. Are we living like our days are numbered? See, most people live as though they have plenty of time. You know, we live in a culture where if you were to ask anybody on the street, do you think you're going to die one day, unanimously they're going to say what? Yes, one day I'm going to die. But yet they're living as though they're going to be on earth forever, even in the church. They know that they're going to face God, but they live as though they are going to live forever. And that is the deception of the culture, the lie that we have bought. Jesus spoke about this, about a rich farmer who, who, who had stored all this wealth. He built barns. And notice what he said in Luke 12 and 19. He said, and I'm going to sit back and I'm going to say to myself, my friend, you have stored away for years to come. He believed that he had years to come. He had stored up in his house, in his barns, his wealth. Okay, he, he had made no plans for the future other than to do what? Just to enjoy his life. There's nothing wrong with eating. There's nothing wrong with drinking. There's nothing wrong with having a good time. God has given us all things for our enjoyment. But yet when that becomes the focus of our life, and we, we are deceived into thinking it's our life to live and not considering God, now the stuff becomes sin. It consumes our life. See, we were put on earth for one purpose, to glorify him and to fulfill his purpose on earth. And if we're missing that, we're missing out on the point of life. 
That man that night didn't have any thought of his life ending. He was planning in his future what he was going to do with his life. He had no thought that he was going to go into eternity that night. He was going to step in and he was going to face God. Let me ask you this. Do you think if he knew that night, if God appeared to him and said, you're going to die at 1.39 a.m., do you think he would have spent his last few hours on earth doing something a little different? Do you think that he would have been planning to build another barn? Do you think he'd be planning his next vacation? I doubt it. And the same with Belshazzar. What was Belshazzar's great sin? Yes, he did mock things that were holy. He, def he defiled things that were sanctified or set apart as the worship of God. He was making those things common. But let me tell you what his greatest sin was. He wasted his life. He wasted what God anointed him to become. He was a king. He was ruling over the most powerful nation in the world. He was deceived in thinking that he was going to reign over Babylon for many years to come. Do you know how long Belshazzar reigned? Two years. And he died in his 40s. He thought he had plenty of time. Now is the time to seize the day, to eat, drink, and be merry. That's what's going through his, his head right now. He said, I'm going to seize that instead of fulfilling his purpose. He wasted his anointing. He wasted the gifts that God gave him. He wasted his rule and authority. That night, he had no idea that the Persians were going to invade Babylon and they were going to kill him. He had no idea. James said this, look here, you who say today or tomorrow we're going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. That's sort of like us, though. We make our plans. Okay, I'll tell you my plans this afternoon. Three to five, we got C group. As soon as this church service is over, we got an evangelism meeting. Then we got our last C group meeting today. That's that, that's that, that's my plans this afternoon. <clears throat> but you know what? What if I what if I don't make it? We live our life like that every day. We make our plans. And what James is saying, okay. You say tomorrow you're going to go to a certain town, you're going to stay there a year, you're going to make a profit. You're going to do your business and do and make a profit. But he said, how do you know what your life is going to look like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while, then it's gone. How do you know you're going to be able to score that deal? How, how do you know you're going to be able to make that trip? How do you know you're going to be able to go and work? And so James, James is setting up the scenario that we all buy into. We make our plans. Now notice, second, number two in the fill-in, our lives should be lived in light of God's will. Verse 15, James said this, What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this and do that. What we have to do to seek the will of God for our days. God, how, how can you use me today? Who, who can I touch today? Who can I pray for today? God, what is your will for my life this day? Because whether you go to, go to an 8-5 to job or whatever your job is, let me tell you what, you're a minister, and God's called you there for a purpose, okay? And he'll give you opportunity. Instead of us making our plans, we need to seek his will for our lives so, so we can use our gifts for his glory. But here, here's, the, here's the thing. And, and just clue in here just for a few moments. Here, here's the thing. As human beings, anytime we have more, we, 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 we tend to squander it, don't we? And let me give you an example. If your freezer is full of food and your refrigerator is full of food and your pantry is full of food and you've got a bank account that not only has your bills paid, but you've got savings and you've got surplus income, 
you, we tend to be a little wasteful, don't we? We tend to be wasteful. Come on, admit it. Y'all just, what is wrong with y'all, man? You're not fooling me. I know you people. I've been here 20 years. I know you. You've squandered it. Why? We don't think about the value of the money. We don't think about the value even of the food, okay? You eat a half, you know, you eat your hamburger. Well, I think I want another, and you take two bites out. Well, I can't eat anymore and just throw it in trash, right? I mean, that's the way people sort of operate. We squander when we think we have enough, or we think we have more than enough. But when it comes down to your last package of hamburger, your last pound, and you got one dollar in your pocket, and that's your last dollar. Now you begin to think of what? The value of the food and the value of the money. See, people need to examine their lives the same way. The reason people squander so much time is because they fail to see the value of their life. And just like Mr. Belshazzar, that night, his life was required. I don't think, I don't think when the Persians invaded and they were sticking the sword to his throat to kill him, that he was saying, doggone, I wish I would have thrown more parties. I wish I'd have had more banquets and ate more food. No. And I, I've shared this many times before as a pastor. I've been on a lot of deathbeds, and there's, there's, you know, the, it always just comes up in my heart when I'm on these types of messages. And and the man was a believer. He was saved. Don't don't get me wrong. I could tell you his name. You know exactly who he is. He was saved. It's, you know, because salvation is a work of the Spirit based on the finished work of Christ and his sufficiency. That's the salvation. Okay. And he had accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. His sin was forgiven. But he was sitting there on his deathbed. And I was sitting there to pray with him. And he looked at me and he said, that he, he said, I wasted a lot of time. There's so many things I wanted to do or should have done for Jesus and just didn't do it. Well, that's not sending him to hell. Why? Because Christ's work is sufficient. We are saved by his grace. That's grace of God by faith not of our works, lest any man boast or brag about it. But the sad thing is, I don't want, I, I don't, I, I felt sorry that he was burdened because he understood, because he was facing his mortality, he had wasted his life, and he was going to face God having wasted it. Didn't mean he was lost, he was saved. But he wasted his life. That's no way to die. That's no way to face your end sitting back in regret saying, I wish I would have, I wish I would have done more, I wish I would have served, I wish I would have given, I wish I would have, you know, restored relationships that were broken in my life, I wish I would have restored the relationship with my children. You understand, there's, there's no way to go into eternity letting that labor and that burden be in your heart. Belshazzar failed to learn from his past, and because he failed to learn from his past, He'd wasted his life. The third thing is this. We need to remember this, that today is the day of God's favor. Today is the day of God's favor. Okay? 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2 says, As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Now, what's he saying? He's saying, look, many of you out there have received salvation, but he said you're really receiving it in vain. What are you doing with the salvation, the gifts that God has given you? Every person that's in the body of Christ has been given a ministry gift to use for his glory. And he said you're just, you're, you're just taking it in vain. He said, in the time, this is God speaking, 
In the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. Now, Paul says, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor and the day of salvation. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children. He said, open your hearts wide. He's saying, guys, don't take your salvation for granted. Today is the day of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. Today, he said, open your hearts wide so we can proclaim the gospel and reach people in the days that we live. So how do we stand apart from this cultural chaos? Because everything I've said this morning, you understand, this is, this is the age that, that we're in. How do we stand apart as believers? Number one is this, live like you're dying. Because you are. From the time you, you come out of the womb and breathe your first breath, you're beginning to die. Everybody is dying. Everybody will face their mortality, save the return of Christ. <clears throat> so we have to live each day like we're dying with an urgency and with a purpose. I like what Paul said in Ephesians 5, 16 and 17. So look at that. Don't waste your time on useless work. Just mere busy work. The barren pursuits of darkness. Expose these things for the sham that they are. He's basically saying don't squander your time. Don't, don't waste your life on, let's, let's rephrase pursuits of darkness. Don't waste your life on barren things that have no eternal significance. It's a scandal when people waste their lives on the things they must do in the darkness, on worthless things where no one will see. There's no eternal significance in it. He said, rip the cover off of those, off those frauds and see how attractive they look in the light of Christ, in the light of eternity. Wake up from your sleep. Climb out of your coffin. Christ will show you the light. So watch your step. Use your head. Make the most out of every chance you get. These are desperate times. Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly, and make sure you understand what your master wants. Psalms 90 and 12, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as I should. Second, make each day count by ordering your life. Make each day count by ordering your life. I'm going to deal with this next week. Our life should have order, priorities. You get more done when your life is ordered, okay? You, you don't need more things to do. You get more done when your life is ordered. You know why? You get the important things go, done. What are my priorities in life? Who's first in my life? What's second in my life? What's third in my life? Those things, those top three, are, are, are the things that I'm going to spend most of my time on. The ones down here around 15 and 20, if I don't get to them, don't need that. Right? We're, so you need order in your life so, so, so you can actually spend time on what's important. And third, we want to live life with eternity in mind. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. Remember this. Jesus offers us more than just a better today. He offers us the best tomorrow. And that's where we're going to be for all eternity. So that's where we ought to be looking and building toward. See, a life is a terrible thing to waste. Belshazzar wasted his life. Tweet by Billy Graham. The greatest waste in all of our earth, which cannot be recycled or reclaimed, is our waste of the time that God has given us each day. Hashtag Billy Graham. Somebody needs to tweet that. That's a truest statement. With every head bowed, every eye closed this morning, we want to be sensitive 
to the Holy Spirit this morning. We're going to do things a little bit different today. As we bring this to a close, here in just a moment, I'm going to open up the altar, and if you need prayer, my altar people, who's going to be praying can come on up if they like, and you know, they're going to be, you know, if you need prayer, this morning we had several come up for prayer in the first service, if you need prayer, uh, they're going to be glad to pray with you, but also I've got, we've got two tables sitting on both sides of the sanctuary. And, and today, uh, if you would like to take communion, we're just opening up the tables for communion. If you, you, you desire to, to take communion today, you know, we want to give you that opportunity. We're going to do that each week to give you the opportunity to respond to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. All right? So we're going to do that here in just a moment. But we're going to begin this morning. Where are you at? Are you saved? Are you born again? Is there anyone in here today? You're not sure about your eternity. You're not sure about your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the first thing we want to make right this morning or get right this morning. If the Holy Spirit is drawing you, wooing you, speaking to you, and you, 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 for any reason, you don't have full assurance. Today is the day of salvation. See, if you believe and respond to the Holy Spirit, and you believe in the sufficiency of Christ, His work, His death, burial, His resurrection, His ascension, and the giving of the Holy Spirit, all you have to do today is call on the name of the Lord, and you'll be saved. And then you'll need to get baptized. Why? It's, it is a work, but yet it's also the wedding band of the believer that just declares to the world that I've been crucified with Christ and raised with Him. So we always want to encourage you to do that. But if there's one in here this morning and you're unsure, I'm just going to ask you right now, just lift your hands. Is that if it, Nobody's looking around. It's very private. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else. If you want to, stand up at this time. We're going to ask everybody to stand up at this time. If you need prayer for any reason whatsoever in your life or you'd like agreement in prayer or maybe somebody you know is in desperate need of prayer, I'm going to ask you to come, and, and they will be glad to pray with you. This morning, if you want to take communion, you can go to Pastor Ted's table, Pastor Jason's table over here, and you can celebrate communion. Jesus, on that, that night before his crucifixion with the Passover dinner with his disciples, he instituted a new covenant, a better covenant based on better promises. And he said to his disciples that night, he took the bread and and he began to distribute it. He said, this represents my body, which is going to be broken for you. I am the bread of life. And whoever eats it will have life. And he takes the cup of wine. And he said, this represents the very shedding of my blood, which will remit your sin, that you can be reconciled to God the Father and be forgiven. And they ate and they drank. Praise God for the sufficiency of Christ and his finished work. That demonstrates his love. So right now, if you will, you can step out. You can take communion. You can come for prayer. And let me say this. If you're a guest and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is open communion. You don't have to be a member of this church. We ask you to step out and, and, and take part of this communion this morning.